everyone, I'm Rachel Poli with Ari Banklin, and we're your hosts for the Merry Writer Podcast. We're on episode 82, and this week's question is, how can you research for your novels? Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening so you never miss a show. And if you enjoy this episode, please give it a like. So how can you research for your novels? It seems like such an easy question to answer, but a lot of times, depending on the novel that you're writing and its genre, it can be very tricky to find a good spot to start your research. And also sometimes you don't even know what research you need until you actually start writing. So I'm gonna throw in a quick disclaimer. You can research whenever you want, whether you wanna do some research before writing or you find things to research in the middle of your writing session, you could do that. Or you can keep notes during your writing session and then at the end, before the editing process, you can get all your research done and out of the way. But I do want to also add that research is kind of a constant thing. As you edit and rewrite your book, you're always going to find something new and different to figure out and to research. One way you can research for your novel is very obvious. You can read books and you can look up information on websites. The library is your friend. I don't know how many people actually go to the library anymore this day and age, but it is your friend and you can go to the library and look up books in any subject that you need. Like for example, if you're writing sci-fi and you need to learn about space or you need to learn about some type of technology that I don't know anything about, just technology in general, you can look up books. You can go on, you can go to a bookstore and there's all these different sections. I'm sure you guys all know your way around a bookstore in a library. I don't need to explain this. And you can also look up information on websites. Google is also your friend, but also you got to be careful about which websites you actually look at. Like, for example, if you're looking for space information, NASA is a really good website. You, they have plenty of information. They're space people. They know what they're talking about. If you Google space information and you find a random blog, that could also be good, but you need to make sure that their information is actually correct. Like you want to you wanna make sure that it's from a reliable source than just someone writing a random article because space is their hobby. You want to look at like experienced people for the most part. I think you're right, especially about the library thing. Because one of the things I've noticed is depending on your topic, the like nonfiction information books, they can be massive. And while I do have a nice collection of nonfiction source books that I use for different research topics, I don't like too many of them because I don't have enough space. They take up so much more space than novels can sit in. So a library is really good for that. So you're not having to fork out 50, 60 quid on some giant tome of an information book that you might only need like 40% of. So you can go to the library and depending on whether your library has the functions, some of them have scanners that you can use and you can literally scan the relevant pages. And even if you can, I would definitely suggest having a notebook and writing down the books that you take your sources and information from and the websites because you'll probably need to refer back. And if you're anything like me, you're not always going to remember the websites you went to, or it's going to be one of those where it's a little bit unusual and you can't fully remember how it's spelled. And you'll end up on a website that's similar, but not exactly the same and it's different information. So, yeah, no, that's not a good thing. And also, as Rachel said, definitely check your sources and if possible, cross reference. If you, if you do find a, an odd non-expert person uh, online, as you said, that they, can, they can have really good information, but try and cross-reference it with someone else who may have more experience and use both to kind of confirm the source. Think of it like academia, where you have to kind of prove your points with the source information. So I know it sounds like really boring when we sort of say that. It's like, this is why people don't like researching. It's like, I want to do that, but it is important. I have to agree with what Ari said. You definitely need to bring a notebook and take notes. Even if you don't scan the pages from the book or anything, definitely take notes and write down the book title and the website information. And also, uh, you can always look up websites through the history on your computer as well, provided that you don't clear your history, which you should clear your history every once in a while, but that's a whole nother story. And especially if you look up weird stuff, like, I mean, I, I look up weird stuff because I write murder mysteries. So sometimes you want to clear your history, but there are, you can 
if you're looking for that one specific website that you found by accident, you can scroll through your history and see if you can find it again if you forgot to write it down. Uh, but yeah, I actually, I have a ton of like nonfiction books. Like I have a police procedural book. I have a book about weapons. I have a poisons book. Like I have weird references for my mystery novels. And also I actually don't have the book because it updates every year anyway, but I have looked at the test guide and or the study guide for like taking the police exam and stuff, because then you can get a real feel of what, you know, it takes to become a police officer and like do all those things. So you can also look at study guides and even textbooks. That's another good reference. I've gone on college websites and I've looked up their classes and sometimes they'll tell you what books you need without, you know, being enrolled. And I'll look up the textbooks from my library and I'll borrow those and I'll just, you know, you teach yourself, you don't get a degree out of it, but you learn a lot of new things. It's fun. So with that said, whether you decide to go to college or not, my next point is to get the hands-on experience because there's no better way to learn than hands-on, which everybody learns differently, I know, but I love getting the experience. Like if you have characters in your books that have horses and they, they ride horses, they take care of horses, they're at a stable, whatever, go, go find a barn near you and see if you can take a lesson or two in horseback riding because trust me it is way different than you would imagine the movies do not do it justice the amount of crap that horses need and they don't like yell at the horses they click and it's very weird the kid i babysit does horseback riding and i've learned a lot in the past six months about horses and it's it's amazing how like movies and stuff, they don't convey what it actually entails to take care of a horse and stuff. So I know I'm, I'm rattling on about this horse example, but if you have horses in your novel, hop on a horse, <laughs> go find a stable and take horseback riding lessons. If you have archers or swordsmen in your novel, go take an archery class, go take a fencing class, which isn't necessarily the same as sword fighting, but I guess it might be similar enough. I don't really know. But there are all these different things you can do to, you know, there, there's so many different classes that you can take. And it'll just broaden your horizons too. Not only will it give you good information for your book, but it'll be something fun and different for you to do as well. Because as writers, we need hobbies. Well, that's it. Yeah, it's like you do the experience for, for the story, but you could find a whole new love for some hobby that you've tried specifically for that. I mean, I've done horse riding and I always found it funny whenever you're in books, it was like, you know, someone's run off and they're like, oh, we've got to chase them. And it's like slapped on the tack and went. It's like, do you know how long it takes sorting the goddamn tack out on a horse? It's not just slap on the saddle and, and buckle it. You've got to check it. You've got to rearrange things get the damn horse to put the bridle in its mouth and you know, the bit in its mouth on the bridle you yep. know just oh no just so annoying this, the idea that it's like this quick thing you just slap it on and go and it's like no no and the same with archery because I've done that too and you have this idea of how it's supposed to look and how it's supposed to feel because you've seen the movies and it's like no no it's not <laughs> but it, it really does it's like you get a totally different immersive feel when you've done that when you and obviously yes say you've got an archer who's on a horseback I don't suggest that you try that unless you become extremely proficient in archery that you start getting on top of a horse and trying to shoot that's not safe but doing one and then doing the other it gives you an idea of like where you're gonna hurt because you're gonna hurt both of those hobbies will eventually hurt all that holding the pulling the so again, pulling the arrow back, depending on the type of bow you've got, because again, that, that makes a difference. How easy it is to, to, to knock an arrow. Again, oh well, yeah, you watch this program, it looks really fast. No, it's not, especially if you're a new person. And I'm so sick of reading books and watching movies where some new person has come on and they're so, you know, like there's some sort of farm hand and they're trying to learn, you know, fighting, sword fighting for the first time and they're a whiz and it's like, crap, that is not true. They need to have an aching arm. They need to have almost like a bruised wrist from all the, you know, 
where they parried and it's put like pressure on the arm and they you know, they need to be sweating and struggling to lift that thing, not just brilliant straight away. So yeah, all these experiences, they don't just show you the mechanics of what you're doing. They show you all the extra things like how to maintain them, how you straighten the bow, how you oil the tack, you know, how you sharpen the sword. It's all, it's a whole thing. It's not just, well, how to do sword fighting. It's like, well, how do you maintain that sword? What happens if it gets snicked on the blade, you know? you know what what sort of oils would you use to protect it what are the different parts it's called because it's all important it all comes into different stories and it certainly adds more flavor to a story if you know this stuff and it's kind of funny too the way that we're explaining all of this it sounds like it would be such an info dump but it's not if if you explain it in the right way then no it's not an info dump it makes it all the more real for the reader and the character is learning about it as well if you're following a character who has never picked up a sword before then yeah these are things that they're going to learn and if you have characters who are already skilled swordsmen swordsmen skilled with a sword yes um then you may not need all of that information you got to pick and choose what you want to convey to your readers but it's always good for you to know in case you know, the subject ever comes up in your book. And my final point is to talk to people. I know we don't like people. We don't like socializing. It's okay. But sometimes you got to do it. And you can do that while you're getting the hands-on experience. I mean, seriously, if you're going to take an archery class, I assume you're going to talk to your instructor and you can ask them questions. Or you can just talk to somebody who's in that career field. For example, if you're writing murder mysteries and you happen to know someone who's a police officer or a detective, reach out to them and and ask if you can interview them and ask them questions about certain things and learn certain terminology and all of that fun stuff. It it really, talking to people is kind of like a different hands-on experience, if you will. But you can take you can talk to them and take notes and, you know, really get get a real feel for what it's like to be a police officer or a firefighter or a teacher or whatever profession you're thinking about. Well, that's it. I mean, I always like the idea of being able to sort of chat to people who have been in it and at different uh, at different points too. you've got people who have been like veterans who have been there for years, people who are, who are new and just how they feel about starting something, people who've been in the middle and maybe, you know, not experts yet, but they're certainly more proficient than a novice. And you also learn other things. When I was in archery, one of my instructors was actually an army sniper. So yeah, he was an army sniper and he used a long bow. It was frigging massive. And you just, it, unless you were very strong, you couldn't pull it back. It was really tight. But so as well as being an archer, if I wanted to, I could have talked to him about being a sniper. So it's not even like you just go in and think, well, this person's going to tell me this one thing. They might tell you something else. And you think, well, I could use that information too. <laughs> so there's so much more. And I don't know, people do like to talk about things that they enjoy, whether it's a job or a skill. And I know sometimes you can feel a bit nervous, especially if you're an introverted writer or you're quite shy. The idea of speaking to someone or asking them and maybe they'll say no. And that could happen. So, I mean, that's one of the good things about social media and being online. You can reach out to people and a lot of people have things in their bio or maybe they will talk about stuff like they will use a hashtag. So you can, you know, search for hashtag horseback riding, hashtag archery, and you can find people and then just reach out to them politely. Just find out, you know, would you be interested in spending a bit of time talking to me? I'd like to learn about this. I'd like to learn about that. They may even be able to give you resources that they know are strong resources to read upon, websites to look at, videos to look at. And that can all help. So definitely go ahead and try and speak to people. I know it can be a bit nervous if you are a very shy person, but that's the good thing about social media. It's all on text. And if they say no, and most people, if they say no, they're very polite. You don't usually get anyone, you know, bitching you out or anything. It's fine. You just say thank you. And then you move on. There's so many people out there with so many different hobbies and occupations. It's fine. You'll always find someone to talk because let's be honest, as I said, people love to talk about things that they enjoy doing. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. And 
while you were saying that, it made me think if if you are a little outgoing and you want to do some good at the same time, I've heard of people going to um, like nursing homes and stuff and they just volunteer and sit sit with the old folk in, you know, the common room or whatever you want to call it. And they just sit and chit chat with these people. And I'm sure a lot of those people, they probably don't have any family or friends that visit them often. And I'm sure they would love to sit down with you and tell them their, tell you their story. So that's another way you can go about it too, because you'll be, you'll be, you know, doing research for your novel. You'll be learning something new and you'll make a new friend out of it and you'll be making someone else feel good. We hate people, but it's always fun to make someone else feel good. <laughs> exactly. It's something you've just said that, that totally reminded me, and I don't know where it is. I, I, it, there might be several of them, but um, I remember reading about it. It was somewhere in Europe, um, and it had the People Library. And what it was was a place where um, usually older people would just go and sit in a library and they'd have like a card near them and it told you what they were interested in or maybe what they were. Maybe they were, an, you know, from in the army, maybe they had been a nurse, maybe they had been a midwife. And what it was was people just went up and booked time with them and sat and talked to them about their subject. And it kind of got people to sort of, it gave them company and it gave people interest and it kind of brought connections. And I just thought that was such a cool idea. That is so cool. That's amazing. I know, right? And it was, I mean, this is probably pre-COVID because everything's pre-COVID. Yeah. yeah, just the idea. And it wasn't even like you had to go up and like start a conversation. I think they had it written down, like what they were really interested in talking about. So they'd written it down. And then if you were like, oh yeah, I'd, I'd like to know about, you know, midwifery, you know, and then you'd sit down and you could, you could easily talk to them about that rather than all that hard preamble of like, hey, can I talk to you about something? You know, so... <laughs> Maybe that's just that's a good idea. <laughs> the, well, I don't have anything like that around here. No, no, you know, I mean, I'm assuming it's one of those things I can imagine growing with popularity, but I just thought it was such a clever idea, uh, especially because people aren't as connected anymore. And, and right. sometimes it's nice to have that face to face. And it's very similar to the thing with the going into the, um, the old people's homes and talking to them. But obviously this was for people who hadn't actually got to that part and they were probably a, a little bit younger than that and had a lot more things to talk about and it was just it was just a nice little idea and I thought you know throwing a cafe and a bookshop that sounds like a brilliant day right I know <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like speed dating I don't know if you had like a time frame you got 10 minutes to talk yep. about midwifery <laughs> <laughs> then they ring a bell and you move on to the next one and it's like oh you know lion taming excellent <laughs> oh my god that'd be so cool <laughs> Anyway, I digress. I'm going to throw in a, a final point, unless Rachel has something else to say, which she might do. But yeah, if you're doing your research, let's talk about organizing your research. Depending on the type of research you do and for what sort of story, you may end up with massive amounts of information. This is very typical in info heavy genres, like anything like historical fiction or sci-fi is another one, because obviously there's a lot of technology and engineering and things like that. I can understand that having it. So before it gets overwhelming, it's a good idea to set up systems for saving and storing that information and obviously for quick and easy recall. If it's websites, you could create a Trello board, we've talked about them before, and create lists that refer to specific topics and then you can add cards which connect to subcategories and add website links into these cards for easy reference because if you're anything like me, you probably don't check your bookmarks because I never check my bookmarks. I bookmark everything and then I never go back and check it. Although, to be fair, I bookmark so much, there'd probably be a lot to run through to find it. So. And for printed material, set up binders with labels, indexes, tabs, anything where you can break your topics down by categories that make it easy for you to sort of flip through. I like to put everything in Polly Pockets so you can kind of, you know, if you're pouring over it with a cup of tea, you know, I'm going to spill and ruin everything. I've done that in the past. This is me learning from my mistakes. And obviously we've talked about books, you know, keep a set of reference books as good as libraries are. There will probably be some topics that you really enjoy. I have lots of books on mythology and similar to Rachel, but not as intense. I don't have a book of poisons, but I love the idea of it. But I do have crime scene uh, procedural books. I do have 
um, manuals on private detection because I have private detectives in my characters. And um, I actually have a course, it was like three binders, huge binders of information, including the surveillance information and uh, equipment and everything. And I really like that and I use them all the time from when I first started writing my, my series that has a detective in. Um, so I, I, I made sure I bought that, I didn't just read it at the library, but yeah, it's a good idea to have them stored separately so it's quick and easy, especially if you need your desk. But yeah, if they're massive, maybe just leave them at the library and just get them there. But yeah, if you do have any, you know, any ones you really like that you probably look through a lot, it's quite nice to have a little reference section. So yeah. That's actually a really good idea to, you know, organizing your research is so important. For me, I'm a little excessive and I have all my information on a Google Doc and I also have it in a notebook because I need to have it in six different places. And I actually do use my bookmarks. And then when I'm done with the website, I unbookmark it. So I actually, that's like the one thing on the computer that I keep organized. Go figure. That is organized. I've never, I've never unbookmarked something I bookmarked. Even if I bookmarked it by mistake, I will not go in and find it and unbookmark it. Yeah, no, I, I don't like to have my bookmarks be obnoxiously long. So once I'm done with the website, I unbookmark it. But I have it written down somewhere else in case I ever do need it again. Question. Uh oh. Is the notepad color coded? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that may have to be um, like a, an extra bonus content. It'll have to be like pictures of your color coded notebook. It's like, this yes, is how you yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and it's the same thing with Trello as well. I put, I put my research on there because in our episode where we talked about using Trello to organize our novels, and I mentioned how I have boards like for each individual novel, I have a separate section just for research alone. So I have links to the websites on there as well. Nice. See? All over the place. Okay. <laughs> organize chaos. That's what it is, though. Yes, yeah. I mean, it 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 works and it helps me, so I'm gonna leave it at that. So I think we've explained everything that we possibly could for this episode. So if you're trying to find a good way to do research for your novels, you can always go to the library or a bookstore and look up nonfiction books, look up information on, you know, good websites that are good sources, get the hands-on experience and talk to people and also keep your research organized because otherwise you'll be kicking yourself later. And that's all I gotta say about that. So with that said, now it's your turn. How do you guys typically research for your novels? We'd love to chat about it. So tell us your answers in the comments or on Twitter using the hashtag The Merry Writer Podcast. And we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. So if you want to get some extra content, you can check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash The Merry Writer Podcast. You can support the show for as little as $1 a month and get some extra bonus content. So tune in every Wednesday for a new episode where we ask all the right questions. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by Reams of Paper. We're killing trees. The music titled Inspired is by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons 4.0.